Welcome to the Real Python Podcast. This is episode 117. How maintainable is your Python code? Is it possible to hold the code of your functions in your head? When is it appropriate to use measurements in a code review? This week on the show, Reika Horvath and Ben Martineau from Sorcery are here to discuss their recent PyCon talk, how to use and how not to use code quality metrics. Reika and Ben share their thoughts on how metrics can provide insights into your Python code. We discuss four measurements of code complexity and what factors into each. We also talk about deciding whether to refactor or rewrite your code. Ben and Reka share their experience in code review situations and the importance of shifting the conversation from subjective opinions toward objective measurements. This episode is brought to you by CData Software, the easiest way to connect Python with data, SQL access to more than 250 cloud applications and data sources. All right, let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. My name is Christopher Bailey, your host. Each week, we feature interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Hey, Reka and Ben, it's good to have you on the show. Hi. Hi, nice to be here. Yeah, Reiko, we kind of know each other from the stuff that you were writing for Real Python. You wrote a couple tutorials there. Do you want to talk about them a little bit? So I wrote uh, two tutorials about pandas back in 2020, oriented or uh, beginner intermediate level, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> and I quite enjoyed it. So at some point, I <laughs> might, I think, uh, I might uh, write articles again. Yeah, we'd love to have you come back and, and write some more. And then we did like a, we kind of have a social thing that we do from time to time where team members get to to meet each other. So we kind of met virtually, gosh, it must have been at least a year and a half ago. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. but it was also really fantastic to see you actually meet both of you in person at PyCon. And that's partly why we were here to talk about your PyCon talk. The talk is titled Actionable Insights Versus Ranking, How to Use and How Not to Use Code Quality Metrics. I like that, the capitalization of the entire word not. <laughs> <in> <laughs> how did you start down the path of uh, coming up with this talk? So this uh, actually started when I uh, began to work for sorcery last year in the autumn. And at the beginning, I was even going to suggest that we should remove metrics as a feature because I completely didn't see the point why uh, we are having them. Ah. <laughs> and uh, But completely changed my mind about this topic was reading the summaries of several user interviews. And I was quite surprised to uh, read from multiple people that, yeah, the metrics are uh, have been really really useful and they helped them reasoning why they are going to refactor of specific function. And this was both helpful when discussing with team members, other developers that yes, this should probably really be changed. And also when explaining management that this is something we should invest at least a bit of time into it. Yeah. I was uh, Try, start, I start to explore a bit that yeah, in which ways we can use these numbers, even if we know their limitations. So you are you're a convert. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the feedback which we got from users definitely uh, changed my mind in this topic quite a lot. Yeah, cool. And ben, how did you start on on this one? Yeah, so it was a regular approach me after she decided to do this talk. So I was definitely kind of just joining in. I joined Sorcerer a little bit later as well, so I was kind of a little bit less familiar, I think, at the time that we started preparing it for PyCon. Yeah, how, how big is the, the team now? Oh, we're six people. Because I had Nick and Brendan were on the show 
uh, pretty early in the life of the podcast. So that was really fun to, to talk to them. And you guys both come on within the last year, you, you're saying? Uh, yeah, I joined in November. Yes, and I joined in October. What's the last year? Okay, cool. So that's really interesting. And I, when you guys kind of talked to me briefly at, at PyCon and kind of went around a little bit about how we could maybe do an episode about this. And so I watched your talk, which is, it's great. All those talks are up from PyCon now and everybody can kind of check them out. Mm. And I, uh, it, it made me kind of go down a bunch of rabbit holes about kind of thinking about this stuff, <laughs> about code quality metrics and actionable stuff. And, and I did a deep dive into Anthony Shaw's talk, um, which I think we'll kind of mention, which is really good from 2019. And then he has a real Python article that kind of is tied to it in some ways and I think might add some color to some of the things that you're talking about in your your talk. So that would be a, a fun uh, topic for us to kind of get into. And maybe we can start with the concept of like, okay, well, l- code reviews, <laughs> <laughs> which I, I know are, it's kind of interesting that you had sort of this initial reaction Rekha, about uh, code reviews generally. Um, had you had bad experiences before where you felt like metrics were used like as like a, a weapon, uh, <laughs> as, per se, um, or something like that? You had like kind of a bad experience or wh- what was your feeling there? That I definitely haven't had such experience with code quality metrics. I had, I have seen uh, uh, meaningful and less meaningful usages of uh, metrics generally, so both in software develop, uh, de- development and and other areas. And okay. And with code reviews, I also, and uh, and not, not just with code reviews, but generally when talking about code, it uh, I could feel that we often use uh, adjectives for describing code, like elegant and nice mm-hmm. and or messy and ugly on the other side of the spectrum. Uh, but uh, that's something we very rarely try to quantify. And so I'd, it might be worth giving it a try. And those users talking about it have uh, definitely convinced me that, okay, in some cases, this might improve the improve conversations and gu- guide them into a more objective direction. Okay. What's your experience been with that, Ben, with the uh, code reviews? Yeah, it's kind of interesting. There's a similar... Reka and I were chatting a little bit about this earlier. Uh, and I think, Reka, Re- you brought up like this really interesting thing that happened with your English teacher talking about kind of the differences between the code review and like the editorial process for like a sort of normal piece of text. Huh. And I think it's kind of true that there's, there's a couple, one of the odd aspects of like a code review is that you're actually doing quite a lot of investigation into into some code at once you're looking for everything from like bugs to style errors to you know interpretability things like doc strings things like yeah uh, types and all of this gets folded into this quite like complicated single process and i yeah i don't know it was, it was fun chatting about that because i'd never thought of it that way but one of the i think good parts about trying to get a handle on things like code quality metrics is like so many other aspects of the design process for code things like writing tests and things like writing doc strings it's a way of setting that aside compartmentalizing it so that you've got a way of thinking about the problem in such a way that it doesn't sort of have too much of a you know blowout effect on everything else yeah 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 i think about that with people very often say they want to use a code format or to kind of get rid of those conversations, uh, you yeah. know, about like how things are sort of organized. <laughs> Hopefully that can eliminate a lot of those kind of issues. But one of the things that wasn't in your talk, partly because it was mostly about, you know, thinking about these, you know, metrics is the documentation side, which I think is, you know, really crucial uh, in there. And I, I know you touched briefly on the end of, of like things that are kind of hard to sort of consider, which is maybe like the naming of things and, and uh, <laughs> things like the quality of the doc strings and how, how something's explained and, you know, or maybe too much documentation or what have you, which I guess could get kind of testy. I think the idea between some of the metrics that you're, you're highlighting in your talk is, is a way to kind of um, make them be more objective. Yes. So making them more objective and I, uh, 
also agree with that point by which Pam brought up that when I compare a code review to, for example, the process which I uh, saw at Real Python, that okay, uh, when I am ready with the draft of an article, there will be at least three different review rounds from three different people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> by different angles. And in a code review, that's a quite mixed bag of things. And I don't think that the solution is to have a involved review process for each single PR because that would uh, may, uh, mean probably multiple days a week. <laughs> but I think that we should really appreciate all the different tools which are able to give specific feedback around one topic within seconds or within some minutes. Okay. The way that you could kind of self-identify some of these things. Yes. So that the reviewer has perhaps a bit less to watch out for and perhaps the reviewer gets some Get also some ideas where to look specifically. So mm. we, I think we don't think about these numbers and the tools that this should replace a human reviewer, but instead of uh, of supporting and guiding this process. Okay, cool. Have you had experiences um, similarly been with like code review, like things getting hung up on um, different topics <laughs> that are maybe not as objective? Sometimes, I mean. Uh, there's a sort of interesting question here for what objectivity like means <laughs> at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Sure. W one of, you know, uh, we can say that we, well, you know, the function length is like an objective sort of thing, but there's a subjectivity in choosing that as the thing that you're focusing on. <laughs> <laughs> sure. And I think that's, that's partly what a lot of the subjective, objective kind of discussions that you have around code review sometimes boil down to when somebody says that they prefer it something in some style or another it's not so much that like they, they could come up with some objective metrics <laughs> that, that, that demonstrated their point okay but i think maybe this is sort of moving ahead a little bit but one of the interesting things to me that came out of the talk was that although there aren't necessarily like objective sort of uh, specific things to talk about that, that what what looks interesting when you sort of look at the whole group think you know open source projects was that there were standards that seemed to be pretty well held across a whole bunch of different repositories and that was really exciting because then it means well it's not so much we're talking about objective or subjective but we are talking about consistent or uh, sort of agreed upon things you know a, a sort of democratic approach yeah and that's been interesting. I, I don't know, sort of coming back to the, the, the original question. Yeah, there, there are sort of some specific types of code review where, you know, I, I've had like arguments with, uh, with the people doing the review to, you know, I'll say, I, I think this is better because X, Y, and Z. And they'll go, well, I prefer this. And, you know, you just go away and see what everyone else is doing, basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when the word preferred comes in, sounds kind of yeah, uh, yeah. not ob objective anymore. <laughs> yeah, well, it's exactly that. It's like uh, objectivity probably isn't right. But, you know, yeah, as you say, preferred or, or agreed upon or conventional, uh, perhaps is a good way of putting it. CData software. Connect, integrate, and automate your data from Python or any other application or tool. At CData, we simplify connectivity between all of the applications and data sources that power business, making it easier to unlock the value of data. Our SQL-based connectors streamline data access, making it easy to access real-time data from on-premise or cloud databases, SaaS, APIs, NoSQL, and big data. Check out cdata.com to learn more. You guys referenced a uh, comic that I thought was funny when I dug down the rabbit hole to kind of look at it. It's uh, from Tom... Holwerda, it's from like 2008, and it was a, a measurement, maybe for code review, that was the WTFs per minute. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and and I thought to myself, okay, yeah, like as you look at something, and th there's different levels of heat for that WTF. Um, it could be like <laughs> like I don't understand what this is, as opposed to like 
why? <laughs> or, oh my gosh, like that's really interesting. You know, like there, it's a good measurement for like several things. I think of like media um, was the way, way somebody else was using it to like think of like as you watch a TV program, you, you know, <laughs> and sometimes you may want that and sometimes you really don't want that <laughs> depending on what it is. But yeah, it, it was uh, an interesting uh, kind of thought provoking uh, <laughs> measurement. <laughs> Another expression along these lines, which I like, is uh, the principle of least astonishment. And uh, I, least astonishment. <laughs> mm. Okay. Yes. No, I just want to mention. Perhaps this expresses that most of the time, the any kind of surprise is not a good thing. And there are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a there's a phrase that we sometimes see, like if, if we're you know, if we're looking at new code or we're writing code, and it, it, there's an interesting one that comes up, which is we say that something is like magic. Mm. And I think quite often introducing too much magic is yeah, like a real, it was a real and it, for, the, for exactly the reason Ray could just said the sort of astonishment principle. It's like it looks great on one level, but yeah, yeah. I, I wonder about that somewhat. It's been one of these things about teaching Python that kind of has come up a lot, and the use of the term magic methods was always kind of an interesting one. Mm. Uh, and so I, I was asking a handful of people, you know, like, you know, what are they actually called? And then I was interviewing somebody else about it, and he pointed it out to me to say, actually, they're really known as special methods. I'm like, okay, well, that I think that actually defines it better and makes it less there's wizards above us that only can touch these things and understand these things and so forth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so I, I like that terminology. Like I, I don't, I don't think of coding as magic. I know the, <laughs> what is the quote, the, any um, level of technology. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it kind of th- it led me to think about something that just kind of popped in my head, like this, this term of that is used very often, of, especially in our world of Python, of something being Pythonic, hmm. and I was like, "Do other languages have similar terms?" You know, and I, I'm like, "Is it like Java-ish or you know, um, <laughs> Rusty or Rustic or you know, like?" And the only word I could find that worked is like the the you know that it something is in the idioms of something like the idiomatic C or idiomatic you know whatever. Um, have you heard other languages use like a similar term as much as we hear Pythonic? So I have definitely I have heard the expression idiomatic Go and idiomatic Ruby quite often, but okay. not a single adjective as that. And uh, you were uh, explicitly mentioning Java, and uh, there I can't recall a similar concept. So when I used to work as a C sharp for Java developer, at least in those teams, those communities. There were often discussions about clean code, but mm-hmm. not as much about idiomatic Java code. That's back several years ago. <laughs> so it looks and feels clean. What does clean code per se, like a quick definition, mean? Uh, great question. I think that uh, the term was wrote up or popularized by Bob Martin then sometime in the early, around 2010. Uh, it referred to mo- most of the time to uh, various principles of object-oriented design and okay. various design patterns. And I mm. I always heard it in c sharp or Java context. I'm not sure how uh, widespread it was okay. that time in other ecosystems. <laughs> sure. Ben, have you heard it in other places, like s- something similar to that? Yeah, no, I think it's, it's as you say, like, uh, yeah, we, we sort of were trying to brainstorm a bit earlier. Um, the, <laughs> I sort of feel like Rusty is something I've heard, but I don't know if that's just like <laughs> yeah, something that sounds like it should be a thing. Um, <laughs> right? Yeah, I just wonder about it. Like, I had a interview. Um, actually, it should come out just before this with Bruce Eckel, and he's written you know a, a bunch of books in the languages you're talking about, Java and and C plus um, plus, and we were talking about like functional programming. We talked about mm. a bunch of interesting kind of uh, terms of like diving into these kinds of things, and it's just interesting to to think about like like the way people talk about languages is interesting, and, and Pythonic is one that it's like if you do like a Google search of that, it's like, really common you know? <laughs> yeah. like and, and and i think about that as far as like 
is there this set of stylistic things that that are unique to, to Python that maybe other languages haven't grasped? Is it you know, does it have to do with the you know the Zen of Python or other things that that kind of lead to that? Mm. I think that Python was among the first languages which defined such a manifesto like this Zen or which, which tried to distinguish itself from other languages, perhaps to to put it that way and saying that, okay, it is more readable, perhaps closer, closer to a human language. So perhaps that's yeah. one of one of the reasons why this adjective Titanic became a thing. <laughs> and a funny thing is that uh, we sometimes have these discussions at Sorcery about Pythonic or not Pythonic code and often in the context of whether there is a consensus about mm. uh, specific yeah. to, uh, specific topics. So then we see two solutions for a problem and we are going to decide whether we want to suggest a rule for it and add it to our rule set. Then this is often a criteria that uh, if there seems to be a consensus like, okay, yeah. this comprehension is more Pythonic than uh, using a for loop, then there is a rule for it. And where this topic seems to be more controversial, like Okay, is this, uh, should we use this comprehension? Should we use map? Mm, which is better? Uh, if there seems to be a lot of discussions around in the community, then we rather leave it and don't create a rule for that. That That's really funny because, like, you know, you guys work for a company, and we haven't really mentioned exactly what sorcery is, <laughs> even though I've had them on the show before and so forth. So if you're, if you're a new listener and haven't listened to the previous episodes, that you may not know what, what this tool does maybe i should have one of you guys explain it if, if you're okay but like like ben like what is sorcery and you know why does that kind of lead us into this conversation yeah i mean <laughs> that's entirely fair enough sorcery is a tool that aims to do automatic code refactoring so the idea is to be able to like detect things like for loops things like nested for loops things like if statements sort of items of code that you could rewrite yeah. in a simpler way and rewrite them for you. And it kind of suggests these things in the, the way that it may feel a bit like a... Yeah. Like a linter would, you know, highlight things and so forth. And these are sort of... Uh, or uh, code suggestions, um, code completion suggestions and so forth. It, it's kind of in a similar tool like that, right? Yeah, exactly. So it lives in the IDE or or on the command line, and as you're as you're coding or sort of in a in a post processing sort of system, it, it'll show you what can be changed um, and how it thinks it's going to do that. So you have to make these decisions all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Very much. So we're looking at. I mean, you know, in the IDE, it's it's essentially taking the whole file every keystroke and trying to trying to see what's changed. The sort of thing that tends to happen is, you know, you'll write a sort of if if blah else something else statement and it'll it'll sort of suddenly tell you ah oh, you can turn that into a ternary expression right so simple things like that which typically would be more readable and and you know is is probably a win yeah exactly and that's kind of where the code metrics come in because exactly what you just said more readable that's really fine if you're doing a code review or if you're doing you know if you can sort of talk with someone but if it's a tool you actually have to define what readability is Right, very defined. <laughs> hmm? Because you're programming it, you're having to exactly. like, I- explicitly define, you know, like, you know, <laughs> this is, uh, in our opinion, you know, or in this tool's, you know, programming, this is better. Yeah, exactly that. <laughs> this is why I'm making the suggestion to you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, cool. I and mean, you can sort of formulate the whole problem. It's like, you know, there's an infinite number of, like, pieces of code that could, perform the same action and in an ideal world all of those infinity of you know in infinite space of code would have some number associated with the readability and you just pick the lowest one although well, you know the, the most readable yeah i guess part of what led this to this talk because you guys referenced it was a kind of a, a somewhat of a new metric that mm. that I, I guess nick or actually maybe both of them were working on and wrote an article on, on your guys's blog, can you fit all of this code in your head <laughs> and added kind of a new metric. And, you know, maybe we could talk about that kind of as part of it, this idea of working memory. And maybe that just lets us dive right into the details of like, okay, well, what are these 
metrics that can be used to guide these decisions. And and working memory is is one of the newer ones. Mm. You guys talked about four of them in in the talk, kind of pretty at, at length on each of them. Do you want to kind of go through them? Yeah. Okay. So the first one you had was function length. Um, Rekha, do you want to talk a little bit about that? <laughs> yes, we included it because this is one which probably doesn't need too much uh, uh, introduction. <laughs> you can, uh, although you can interpret it in two ways, like just looking at the code and seeing how many lines it contains, and also uh, the other measurement, which our analyzer tool uses it, actually counting the statements. I think that if you really are, are not interested in uh, more sophisticated metrics and think uh, you think that for your project it doesn't re uh, really add a lot of benefits, the, even this very, very simple one can make your thinking a bit, a bit, and your conversation, conversations perhaps a bit more objective about it. What would be the, the goal that you can think of as, as, a, as a measurement there? Where, where should someone aim for potentially with function length? I think that what we found was that in most of the repositories that we looked at, the majority of the functions were under 10 lines. Please correct me then if you are okay. wrong. And even here, uh, and this is a trend which we observe with all various metrics that there used to be, there is a distribution with quite big outliers. So we looked at these various open source repositories and I think we can say that generally the quality of the code there was pretty high and all these metrics were pretty good and really the vast majority of the functions, for example, was under 10 lines. And then there were some outliers which were significantly longer and then there were perhaps even some outliers way above 100 lines. And <laughs> yeah. I wondered about those, like, you, at the end of your talk, you have these graphs that kind of show, uh, you know, generally where some of these fairly known libraries, uh, requests, Black, um, a handful of other ones that people, you know, commonly import <laughs> and so might be <laughs> familiar with in, in one way or another, but probably may not have di you know, dug into the code and looked at them directly. And the majority of them, and I don't know what the percentage is of overall were below 10. And then you had these really interesting outliers where they were like functions that were potentially 100 lines or, or, or what have you. And what I wonder about in that case, was was there a categorical type of thing that's like, okay, well, that those were tests or those were setup areas or, or, or things like that? Or was there any kind of pattern that you could see in that? Or I don't know if you went in and looked at that or you were... When you saw these outliers, I think of doing a little bit of data research myself, and those are always the ones I go like look at. You know, yeah. Did you research them <laughs> at all in that way? Yeah, I did. A, I did a little. Uh, it was it's sort of awkward because I don't like call out particular repos. Um, sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> the names but will be was... redacted to protect the, <laughs> the innocent. <laughs> Bleep me out. Exactly. Um, <laughs> I, I'd, I'd kind of say it was almost the other way around that. Uh, tests and stuff often were were really short. You know that they'd, they'd almost skew the metrics okay. the wrong way. In, in some places, I, I sort of tried to avoid doing like looking at the test repos mm -hmm. for those statistics because they're just, they're often just one liners, and they're not really telling you much about the quality of like the code that you're going to need to go and refactor. Mm -hmm. And what I sort of noticed for a couple of those that we looked through is actually sometimes it was like really key functionality that was all embedded in this one big algorithm, basically. Uh, okay. And that's not, it, it's an interesting sort of, it becomes an interesting problem to solve because clearly that, that big function works and it's doing a lot of important stuff. Right. And breaking it up could arguably make it harder to work with, you know, if you've just got this nice single interface that, that everything else hooks into. Right. But there, are, there, were, there were some seriously egregious outliers, like 2,000 line functions that Ooh. were just, <laughs> you'd like, you wouldn't touch with a barge pole. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's cool. To, uh, you know, that's something I, I kind of wondered about while I was looking at those metrics. Like, okay, what, what what's in those things? Is that most of the things you think about with functioning, the, the, the idea that 
the word aim, I'll put in quotation marks, um, you know, aim for conciseness isn't necessarily uh, out of all of these things that these are sort of, you know, guides to kind of move in that direction. But that I think is kind of the the thing that you wanted to bring across there is this idea, like generally we look at cleaner or potentially easier to maintain, I guess, is one of those uh, terminologies. Yeah. That the aiming for conciseness is is uh, a good factor to look at. And I kind of think that leads us to maybe the second one, which <laughs> I, I thought of the Prodigy song <laughs> immediately when I thought of uh, cyclomatic complexity. <laughs> which one? Um, the, the breathe. It's like cyclomatic <laughs> I'm just saying. Let's look it up. You are the victim. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I, I had a little prodigy mm. sound sample at the end of the episode. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. Gotta, gotta lead with that. Mm. In this case, it's sort of where code sort of branches and looks at maybe like the ideas of uh, a bit triangular versus flat code in some ways. <laughs> yeah. Some some mm-hmm. descriptions that I've heard of it. And Anthony Shaw had a really great real Python article about refactoring Python applications for simplicity. And then his, his talk kind of at 2019, PyCon kind of built on top of that. And then he has a tool that measures stuff that kind of gets in between the two of these things we're going to talk about next. And what I liked is his example uh, is sort of metaphor of thinking about travel. And in this case, he was using the Lisbon uh, Metropolitan Railway System in Portugal to explain this idea of navigating. And in, in if you were to look at that map, you know, it's you can kind of hold it in your head and kind of look at it and see where what the paths are that you would take from here to here to here. And you can kind of think of it like, okay, what are the number of lines that you need to travel on in order to get to your destination? Mm. And then very (laughs) much later in the article, he shows an image of the London Underground. (laughs) And uh, you go, okay, yeah. (laughs) That's way more complicated (laughs) to try to think of like how I could get where I want. And I can think of other, you know, traffic systems that are like that. So, yeah. So I thought that was kind of neat. And so, you know, maybe we can dive a little deeper into like, what constitutes the cyclomatic complexity? Ben, you want to take this one? Yeah, sure. I kind of liked researching this one because it it was a great example of something that it was very easy to find descriptions of the calculation that avoided kind of getting to the point of what it was actually trying to measure. And it's exactly as you say, it's it's a, it's fundamentally a question of if you have a piece of code, how many directions are there through it how how many branches might i take on my way from top to bottom and in practice it's uh, that's kind of hard to calculate in modern programming languages because we we've started to develop a bunch of pieces of syntax that are, are you know more or less ubiquitous things like match statements things like dictionary lookups that probably constitute branches of some description yeah and they're not at all defined in the original sort of part, you know, in the original definition of cyclomatic complexity, which was all about sort of if statements and else statements and that sort of thing. But that, you know, that, that's that's why it was fun to look at was because you, you've got, you've still got this this concept, which is around today of, of how do I get through my code? Right. How, how do I make a, a piece of code as, as linear as possible, as, as single, a single purpose as possible? Because that's something that we think about, you know, whenever someone says how to how to make this code better? Well, things like the single responsibility principle come to mind. And that's basically an encapsulation of that. Yeah. <laughs> I went and looked at the paper that you yeah. referenced also, <laughs> and which is interesting because it has a lot of references to a lot of older languages. Yeah, very much. And it made me like have a real like like throwback moment of like, oh yeah, go to statements. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember those in basic. I remember doing them on my calculator. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, but yeah, here's a, yet another path and you have to like, you know, find that <laughs> yeah. location where the code goes and um, sort of the flow chart of it. So, uh, and the idea is that you kind of develop a, a, a numeric value based on this, these branching paths, right? Yeah, exactly. And it doesn't it doesn't precisely matter how you do that in the way that we've sort of got it ready for the uh, for the talk. We uh sort of basically counted up the number of if statements, counted up the number of accept handlers and this kind of thing. 
Yeah. But yes, a numeric value of some description based on the number of branching paths is uh, is the, the sort of underlying point. Okay. And the idea is, you know, hopefully to keep that smaller and keep it navigable that, you know, you can kind of have that image of the train map in your head. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. And it's, you know, at the end of the day, that's always, that number is going to go up. If, if your code only did one thing, it's probably not enormously useful. So there, there are always going to be branches. Do you feel like pattern matching the way it's implemented in the newest versions can help with that? Is that something, I think that was actually something that I had brought up to the guys back in, you know, the, the early episode we did that that was something that was being looked at. <laughs> um, so I don't know if it's in newer versions. I, I could see how hmm. it could look a little cleaner in some ways because I was used to that in in other languages um, and was kind of excited by, by it in some ways instead of having to have such structures of, of if and else and elif and so forth. Hmm. Are you using uh, any of that yourself, the pattern matching? I definitely agree that but. Pattern matching is uh, very useful for some use cases, like especially with nest, handling nested data structures. Mm. So, for example, if you got messages from an external system, which have like five different levels and it's mapped as a dictionary. So, phrasing the conditions for that and validating that is much easier with better and, and much uh, more re- readable with pattern matching than with classical if expressions and nile checks. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting that it doesn't actually affect the the sort of theoretical co- cyclomatic complexity. Sure. So yeah, it really is one of those things that's like, well, the readability counts that it's... Right. We're not doing it yet because it's a as a, <laughs> as a sort of Python three point ten thing. There's quite a lot of stuff to consider around the tool, but yeah, there's a lot to add. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is there like some kind of like a you know attribute discount or something like that? You know, some percentage thing that is now so yeah yeah uh, exactly. changing it. Yeah, interesting. This week, I want to shine a spotlight on another real Python video course. The course is based on a topic we touch on during our discussion this week, and it asks the question, what does it mean to write Python code in the way it was intended, or as many call it, Pythonic code? It's titled Writing Idiomatic Python. The course is based on an older video course by Mahdi Yusuf. Instructor Martin Royce has updated the course for modern Python, and he takes you through how to access and interpret the Zen of Python how to initially set up a Python script, how to test truth values, how to take advantage of built-in functions and methods, how to swap variables in place, the dry principle, and how to create Pythonic for loops. It's a short course, and I think you'll find this a worthy investment of your time. It's a great overview for people coming from another language, as well as an introduction for programming beginners to the idiomatic practices within Python. And like all the video courses on Real Python. The course is broken into easily consumable sections. Plus, you get additional resources and code examples for the techniques shown. All of our course lessons have a transcript, including closed captions. Check out the video course. You can find a link in the show notes, or you can find it using the Enhanced Search tool on realpython.com. So then that kind of gets us into... What I feel is really, I don't know, related in, in a lot of ways. It, it it takes the idea of branches and adds some more ideas to it, and that's cognitive complexity. And hmm. Rekha, do you want to talk about that one? So, yes. So, cognitive complexity used uh, cyclomatic complexity as a starting point, and hmm. it was uh, developed at Sonar in uh, if I, in 2016, I think, was the paper about it published. And I think the big difference uh, compared to the previous two metrics is that they those so function length and cyclomatic complexity both looked at the code from a uh, from the code point of view and this cognitive complexity wanted to get it from the human maintainers uh, point of view <laughs> Does it make my brain hurt? <laughs> <laughs> it's like kind of that, and it's probably not a coincidence that it's a much newer uh, concept than cyclomatic complexity, and it uh, 
started exactly with those limitations of psychomatic complexity, which Ben uh, mentioned, that some structures in modern uh, la languages uh, weren't really taken into account. And also mm. uh, one significant difference is that it penalizes nested structures. So, for example, nested uh, if statements and try except blocks. And this is something which doesn't make a difference for a computer regarding how many paths it uh, needs to right. check, but it does make a huge difference for a human who tries to understand and change that code. Yeah, I think of uh, nesting different travel systems on top of each other, you <laughs> <Yeah>. know, <laughs> or something like that. It's like, okay, from here, you're going to have to walk, <laughs> you know, so now you're above ground, <laughs> you got to figure out the mapping there, and then now you're back in the, you know, metro station, and then you're going to take an Uber here, and you know, or whatever. Yeah. And recursion is <laughs> one of them that's in there, which I, I, I find kind of interesting. Like initially, I think, that it's kind of a hit, you know, in, in some ways, like I think for like something you talked about before, those really in-depth algorithmic kind of long function length kind of things, uh, recursion may be part of that, you know, maybe part of the algorithm. Mm -hmm. um, but here, as far as someone trying to understand it, it, it definitely is a, is a hit on the cognitive complexity. Do you feel like there is reasons that someone should steer away from recursion generally? Like, it's kind of interesting addition there. I don't know. What do you think, Ben? Yeah. It, that, that's such a hard sort of, that's, that's kind of a general problem. <laughs> yeah. Um, it is weird. I think, I think it very much depends on the problem context. A lot, you know, uh, uh, in a lot of cases, we're dealing with data structures and, and concepts that have some element of recursion to them okay and like uh, i don't know what you know we, 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 what we've been talking about we spend a lot of time looking at like syntax trees and stuff like this for our, for our work and for the for the analytics and that's a naturally recursive sort of structure and if you try and express uh, functions over recursive structures in non-recursive ways it sort of makes it worse it, it makes it really hard to <laughs> reason about if you're not talk, you know if you're not d deliberately working with that recursion hmm. but there are definitely ways of approaching problems that don't seem naturally recursive where you can introduce recursion and that makes it more complicated um it might make the code simpler but it doesn't necessarily make it easier to reason about okay an example, I don't know, to, like my personal example for me was was trying to get to grips with functional programming and and sort of trying to understand a list of like trying to understand this uh, this concept of like a linked list was was completely new to me. You know, where each each uh, entry in a list is basically appended to an existing list, so that you've got this kind of right. Unnaturally, to my mind, anyway, recursive data structure, and you can write really elegant short functions that operate on that. But from a readability perspective, it's a lot easier to think about it as a flat thing. Yeah, and I don't find that with trees, which do have this sort of natural recursion structure. So, yeah, I wonder about like people using recursion as opposed to potentially using built-in tools of the language. You know. AKA Pythonic things. Well, yes. <laughs> and those would be, I, I would guess, potentially things that, that a, a tool like sorcery would like maybe flag and say, you know, you could use this. <laughs> yeah. This, uh, this, this, uh, <laughs> this can do the sorting for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, you know, that's part of the language. And then I, one of the ones that was like a, there's like minuses, like nesting and recursion sort of like, on the negative side, and then it was like pluses, which was a, the first time I'd seen that, mm. um, which were shorthand structures. And I, I didn't get too deep into the paper, so I wasn't sure what they per se were meaning by that. What is a shorthand structure? I think exactly what just uh, you have mentioned, then a language, okay. like, and that is one of the big strengths of Python, that a language which uh, just introduced easier way or a built-in uh, function to express a complex structure then it is preferred by cognitive complexity if you use it. So, uh, for example, context managers from Python are an example, but also like this all any, yeah. this kind of built-in uh, functions, they, they, they all uh, just shorthand structures. 
Nice. Yeah. And then that kind of helps maybe, I mean, y- you need to know the language, but <laughs> that helps the the readability of it in, in a lot of ways. Cool. And then that kind of gets us into the newer one that kicked off a lot of these ideas, the working memory. And I've already kind of mentioned that cognitive complexity idea that does it hurt my brain? Um, (laughs) And this one is maybe more like, can I hold this in my brain as far as the amount of things I I can kind of, I think the term was scope, the amount of scope that you can kind of maybe hold there. What's the premise there? Mm -hmm. What was it from? The magical number? Yeah. Bye, yes. (laughs) And that was a, a paper, right? A psychology paper, psychological review. And I think of like, you used an example of in the talk of, can you remember these numbers? The one that was kind of easy for me being US centric was, was a phone number, you know, <laughs> like a, <laughs> yeah. a, a list of seven, I can kind of, I immediately break it into three and four, you know, yeah. <laughs> kind of thing. Um, I guess if you deal with other numbers that are like that, maybe somebody who works in a an office that deals with, uh, I don't know, social security numbers or something like that format would do the same kind of thing, breaking <laughs> 10 numbers apart or something. But is that something that is that just like a like kind of like a idea that formed in their heads or when they were working on it? Do you know the background? I'm not sure about the background. So this metric was invented by Nick and Brandon, our colleagues at Sorcery, and I think one reason was that we have already had some metrics which whose main purpose was to decide whether to suggest the uh, refactoring or not, and whether okay. this will improve the code's uh, ma- maintainability or not. And it was kind of a missing piece of the puzzle. And it was inspired partly by the cognitive complexities, human-centered uh, approach that, yeah. yes, we if we are talking about maintainability, then we should uh, think how easy it, it is to work with with it. And yes, so this uh, study with the uh, which found that seven plus minus two independent pieces of information is something which people can keep in their short-term memory uh, efficiently. Uh, that, that was a motivator of it. And one big advantage is that this metric has a as a good target that way, that okay, anything yeah. uh, above n- uh, nine is probably a bit difficult. And one thing which uh, these cognitive uh, so co- cognitive research found was that they mentioned that when people need to keep more information in their head, they try to create patterns uh, about it and group them in mm. in uh, various ways. And uh, using these strategies, people were able to keep uh, significantly more information in the head. So in one famous study, there was a guy who, uh, who was a runner and he was able to uh, remember, I don't know how many hundred digits because he converted all of those into running results. And so, so that, okay, this would be a reasonable time at 800 meters, this would be a reasonable time at 10K and things like that. And uh, huh. so, so you need to start to create these patterns, even more or less automatically. And in code or big advantages that we have the language which and the various uh, structures from the language itself or from the libraries which help us create those those patterns and instead of asking the reader of the code to come up with their interpretation you can start to to group it and add those patterns to the code actually and this helps to create a much better common understanding. I think of people trying to remember, uh, I don't know, parts of anatomy or something like that, Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) Mm -hmm. you know, for tests and stuff like that and coming up with songs and and so forth and all these kind of interesting (laughs) um, ways of grouping, grouping information to try to hold it in your head. Well, it's like the the phone numbers, like you just said, right? It's kind of similar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The group uh, techniques for grouping that, that are familiar in, in, used to <laughs> it's kind of funny like we think about this idea of code review and the this reviewing of human written code and i i wonder in some ways like the idea of com- machines writing their own code and and wondering like okay well since they may not care <laughs> would they potentially make it more complex or not you know <laughs> like i wonder mm. what the direction of that is in some ways um, there's a a talk at the elixir conf that um, one of my 
coworkers, Garano went to, and he wrote the test statements um, of what this thing was supposed to test for, which was like kind of like a, in this case, a, something that would, it's like an interview question, like check for something being a palindrome. Hmm. He wrote just basically the tests, and then he ran it into OpenAI to see if it would generate the code for him. And he did it in front of us. So we were at a meeting the other day, and it took actually three tries, hmm. but eventually it did pull out like a pretty common, you know, way of doing it, you know, using one of those slice operators, to kind of reverse things. And mm-hmm. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> sort of interesting, like things happening there of of taking code and and, and adding it. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> no, it's it's true. There's a kind of uh, I think there's a corollary in terms of like machines writing their own code with with the way that we're seeing machines doing more modeling, right? Okay. I, I worked at the Met Office for a bit, the the well, weather forecasting service here in the UK, and they've got a big sort of non machine learned model for the weather. And the big advantage is that they can see every part of it and they know exactly how it's going to work. Mm-hmm. So for them, it's easy to go in and sort of, you know, adjust parameters as, as we learn more about, about climate. Whereas a model or, you know, I guess the, the analogy here is a, a, a piece of machine written code doesn't need to be something you can interpret. It just needs to work. Yeah. I hear the term black box, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it, yeah, I think it, it it will depend, I guess, on on whether or not we're expecting to interact with that code going forward. Hmm. You know, a, a hmm. machine generated code will almost certainly be optimized towards machines being able to rewrite that code. <laughs> <laughs> I think if I were a machine, I'd want hmm. my brain to work in a way that I understood really clearly. Yeah, hmm. yeah, I definitely would want it to maintain some readability or understanding behind it. I mean, there's, hmm. you know. And get go down a whole rabbit hole of ethics and and so forth of yeah. like well, where you're training the stuff and you know, you know the bias elements that could be you know yeah, applied in different ways yeah so mm-hmm. I guess we kind of need to kind of move toward wrapping some of this up and it, it, part of it was that you had some suggestions and again that not in <laughs> in your title <laughs> you know how not to do this and one of the the things you had is the the idea of like. All right, take all these things as as numerics and just throw it at somebody is probably not a a, a, a good idea. Mm. Or potentially aggregating some of these. Like, what are some of the problems there? You mentioned them as like kind of a bad technique of mm. aggregating some of these things and uh, applying them. Yes. So there are two main reasons why aggregating uh, is usually a bad technique, and the one is that we have already touched upon is the how the distribution looks like. So in most of the repositories, these uh, metrics had a log distribution, meaning that, yes, we had many, many mm. uh, very small functions and a few which are perhaps somewhere between, let's say, 10 and 100 lines, and then a few uh, real, really huge outliers with uh, above 100. And yes, since some code base is even above 1,000 lines, and in a uh, in a distribution, which is uh, on a log scale, it's so average is a very misleading number because it doesn't okay. really tell you anything about how it looks like. And then the second topic is that within a code base, not all piece of code has the same importance, mm-hmm. provide different functionality are executed, but perhaps some of them is never e- executed. So in this way, saying that so average implicitly assumes that uh, and and a lot of aggregations and they assume that these are well these all have the same importance. Mm. So I think that these numbers are can be very useful on a micro level that okay, you have changed this function and suddenly uh, it, it com- complexity went from five five to twelve, then okay, you should perhaps think uh, consider whether it was really a good idea. But <laughs> Uh, the the bigger uh, view we, we take, the more co- uh, cautious we need to be whether what these numbers tell us. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you guys mentioned also the idea that you know, anything something becomes measured or you, you get in kind of a, a situation where it becomes somewhat mechanical in in the way that a code review is done, that something can be gamed. I, I thought of a 
a company, uh, some people I'd met that th- one of the tools that they developed was for managers to basically look at the different developers on their team and their, it was like a way to kind of view their GitHub interactions and commits and, and things like that. And mm-hmm. I thought to myself immediately, like, oh my gosh, I could see how people are going to game it right away. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like if, if that's what the, what their basis is on, you know, like, um, and I don't know why my brain did that, but it just, to me, like that isn't necessarily, you know, a, a factor of quality in a lot of ways, you know, like these kinds of things, like the sort of blame potentially also, you know, looking at these things like oh, this person writes complex code or this person writes this and so forth and kind of gets I- interesting and, and <laughs> maybe not the best of, uh, of, of gaming of metrics there. <laughs> you put in at the van, uh, I kind of saw this in some of the description in the YouTube version of the talk that these are great as warning signs, but not as proof of excellence. I wonder that one of the things we did not touch on was this idea, you know, we're talking code review here, and then the end goal of that potentially is to say, should this be something that should be refactored or potentially uh, go all the way to the level of, like, should this be rewritten? I don't know if, like, I kind of wonder where those metrics kind of come in into play. And and is that a a common conversation? Like, I wonder about the thousand line (laughs) (laughs) um, functions and so forth. And like saying to somebody, well, you know, I think you should refactor that or um, potentially rewrite it. Like, how often does that come up? I think Ray could have probably had more experience of this kind of thing than I had. Mm So, yeah, I think that it definitely depends on the context and the company, but I think these kind of com- conversations can come up quite often, especially in a okay. bigger uh, legacy code base, and the scope of it can be also quite different, like starting with really just a rewriting a single function to even deprecating a whole package, and especially in a bigger environment with multiple teams and multiple projects, it is a very uh, valid approach to say that, okay, we already have an internally developed library for this purpose. Let's just reuse it as much as possible. And uh, in those cases, it's often very, both very difficult to decide whether it's really worth reusing it or should we write something for our own purpose. And it often also becomes a difficult discussion from the from the human point of view. Definitely. Very emotional. <laughs> the emotional. And there, there is this book, I think, Managing Technical Depth, where there are several points, how you uh, should approach your technical depth. And the very first is reify technical depth. And what they mean with it is that uh, when we start talking about these topics, the conversation often drifts into... In, into organizational and various directions that, okay, why was this code written that time and, and whatever. So it, it, it's, it's often much more about the organizational policy than about a technical topic itself. Yeah, yeah. One thing where perhaps numbers can be helpful is to move this, these conversations more into back to the technical stuff and instead of saying that, okay, we so it, it, it is messy and we need to refactor it. Let's try to measure how messy it is. And Yeah. Well, after doing this research along with you and, and looking at these tools and looking at a lot of these ideas and you know, looking at Anthony's tool, his thing called Wiley that kind of is looking mm-hmm. at code complexity and kind of coming up with a, a maintain, maintainability index. Uh, I feel that as I get into more, again, I'm typically a solo developer and creating things on my own. I could see myself running these metrics and kind of getting an idea of like, you know, where things sit. And that I think is one of these tricks that that was kind of nice about doing the deep dive and looking at some of the links you guys provided as I ran into uh, this Jeff Atwood (laughs) blog post where he had this, you know, basically a a thing of who's your coding buddy, Mm -hmm. like the idea of having someone else that can look at your code and, and kind of get feedback. And 
I, I think in this case, it would be like, <laughs> it's like everybody having a watch or, or other kind of health meter, you know, like measuring how many steps you take a day. It's like something that you were never paying attention to before. Um, <laughs> and now you're, 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 you're kind of aware of what's happening in your life. And it's like, well, maybe I should occasionally measure my own code and look at what's going on with it. So and it's kind of interesting. And so in sorcery, it actually will give you that sort of score, right? You can, I, I'm not sure if you have to like run a, a particular script to kind of see uh, at the end of, you know, a particular, you know, file or what have you, like that it gives you those measurements. Uh, no. So in, well, in the IDE version of the, of the product, it's, uh, it's just running live. So you can like hover over the function definition and, and, and see some of these scores. Oh, okay. Yeah. It'll um, give you those. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. The only problem I have with it is the the emojis kind of make me like maybe sad. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, and that's you know, it's like it's like most metrics where you've always got to balance the the, the pragmatism against the you know the, the do you have time now to fix this? Do you have the inclination now? Is this a special case where you shouldn't bother? This kind of thing. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you see that, like, if if you were working on your own and now you know a lot more about this, is this something that you would run on your own code? Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, I think part of it's a little bit... It, it can feel a little bit condescending, I think, towards yourself if you're doing that, because it's like, I can see my own code. It, it obviously looks fine. Hmm. Right. But then sometimes something comes along that surprises you. You see, you know, you suddenly notice a function that you'd come back to a few times and it's sort of grown all out of proportion and it's fine because it fits in your head because you've been developing on it right but if it's ever going to be you know given out to someone else if, if anyone else is ever going to have to look at it it's a great way of going that's just you everything that you've done here is <laughs> is is yeah. currently locked up in your own brain so fix it <laughs> <laughs> well i wanted to get into the regular weekly questions and so I was going to ask each of you I don't know if you want to start. Um, what are you excited about in the world of Python? And that could be like an event, book, package, editor, what have you. I'm mostly excited by the recent changes to 3.10 and also the planned changes to 3.11. And what I especially liked were the new error messages. Yeah. And <laughs> I, <laughs> I think that this also fits really well to our topic of readability, maintainability, and how we comprehend things, and I really hope that uh, several packages will also follow suit and improve on this. Yeah, it was fun to talk to Pablo about that. I, I learned a lot, you know, talking about the idea of uh, a parser, kind of diving into those things. And awesome, Ben. What what are you excited about? I've been sort of, you know, on, on a personal level, looking quite a lot at Rust lately. And I think from a Python perspective, it's really cool to see the way that some of these libraries are being rewritten in a sort of transparent way under the hood in Rust and the way that the bindings work. Hmm. I think it's just really exciting to be able to have a way of sort of dropping between languages in a nice, easy way that you would actually want to do. They complement each other really nicely. So I've been looking at things like PyO3 and stuff like that to, to work with that a little bit. Cool. That, that is one of the most common things I hear <laughs> um, outside of that, as far as like what mm -hmm. they want to learn next is, is Rust comes up all the time. And so that, that sort of, I don't know, coziness between the two languages is, is something that, that definitely by asking these questions every week, I keep hearing more and more developers that are interested in on you know one side or the other. So cool. Yeah. Reka, what do you want to learn next? And again, this doesn't have to be programming or Python specific and something you want to learn next. I think my next bigger uh, topic will be performance uh, testing. And this is also connected to what uh, Ben uh, brought up with, uh, with Rust and also B. I have already worked a bit on performance testing and this kind of measurement, but want to lean on it more in the next couple of weeks, months. Where do you learn more about that? Where, where is, uh, are there resources that you can find to, mm. to learn more about that topic? I was looking into Kaleen, if I pronounce it correctly, mm. <laughs> for benchmarking and also PyTest pl uh, plugin for this. So... <clears throat> Okay. Ben, what uh, what are you interested in learning next? 
<laughs> when I start giving the game away. But um, yeah, I'm definitely sort of most interested in, in expanding and understanding Rust. And um, I think what, like being really specific in there is about problems of memory management. Python's very friendly in that it doesn't, yeah. it forces you, you know, it, it allows you to forget all about that. And having to really think about, you know, the, the yeah. mapping between data and your computer and, and how that interacts with, with processes has been really cool. Okay, awesome. And then we usually end each episode with a way that people can keep up with the things that you do online. And Reka, what what's the best way that people can follow the things that you do? Well, I currently don't have that much of an online presence. So the best way to follow is source of the AI on Twitter or uh, follow our blog. Okay. And Ben? Yeah, similar. I don't have, I, you know, <laughs> not very big on the sort of socials. Um, I do have a Medium page uh, that I sometimes, a couple of every couple of months, post to. Yeah, it's just at Ben H. Martino on LinkedIn, on, uh, on Medium. <laughs> okay, awesome. Well, Reka and Ben, I, I really want to thank you so much for coming on the show. It's, it was really fun to talk to you. No, thanks for having us. Thanks a lot. It's been fun. Don't forget, you can get simple cloud data connectivity to SaaS, big data, and NoSQL from Pandas, SQL Alchemy, Dash, and Petal. Learn more at cdata.com. I want to thank Reka and Ben for coming on the show this week. And I want to thank you for listening to the Real Python podcast. Make sure that you click that follow button in your podcast player. And if you see a subscribe button somewhere, remember that the Real Python podcast is free. If you like the show, please leave us a review. You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey, and I look forward to talking to you soon.